It was 20 years ago, uh, this last spring, that I headed for Buenos Aires to do a series of lectures. And on the way, I stopped for three days in Sao Paulo, Brazil, for several lectures. The first of which was the monthly luncheon of the Sao Paulo American Chamber of Commerce, a monthly meeting. And the MC on this occasion was a Brazilian by the name of Fernando Lee. And as he got up to introduce me, he said, ladies and, uh, he said, gentlemen, you, you, you probably wonder why I'm presiding today. Well, the president is away, the first vice president is away, the second vice president is away, and I'm the third vice president. He said, I'm reminded of the Portuguese law firm by the name of Pereiro, Pereiro, Pereiro e Pereiro. The law firm received a phone call. The voice over the phone said, may I speak to Senor Pereiro? Sorry, Senor Pereiro is in London. Well, then may I speak to Senor Pereiro? Sorry, Senor Pereiro is home in the flu. Well, then may I speak to Senor Pereiro? Sorry, Senor Pereiro is in a committee meeting. Well, then may I speak to Senor Pereiro? Speaking. <laughs> <coughs> That's a true story. Uh, incidentally, uh, in my lecture Wednesday morning, I uh, made reference to Mises, you know, and when he'd ask what he would do if he was, an he was a dictator, he said, I would abdicate, which then caused me to uh, write an article, If I Were King, and in it my thesis was, I would abdicate. Well, I have a very good friend by the name of Ralph Bradford, who was for years president of the United States Chamber of Commerce, a historian, a great scholar, and also a remarkable poet. And also, he knows how to do cynical things beautifully. And he read my piece, and here's what he wrote. If I were king, I'd abdicate, or junk the throne at any rate. Or maybe I would merely doff the purple mantle, or leave off the jewel crown. For as I muse, it strikes me I cannot refuse the cup. For who, I ask, am I the call of duty to deny? Endowed with gifts that others lack, it seems to me that I must try to keep them on the proper track to teach them how to earn and spend and be most useful in the end. How can I answer heaven pray upon that final judgment day if I have shirked to do my bit to make the race of man more fit? So I shall drink that bitter cup. Yes, I shall take my burden up and work to make men fine and free and good and true and wise like me. <laughs> I think that's beautiful. <laughs> well, another thing I want to do... Um, in other words, I'm going to try to demonstrate this morning only two things. Number one, this is not a numbers problem. And number two, this is not a selling, but rather a learning problem. And uh, to give you a, a good idea of my own ideas on this, I want to refer to one of my favorite philosophers, Edmund Burke, who wrote this, oh, I think 1795, nearly two centuries ago. He said, how often has public calamity been arrested on the very brink of ruin by the seasonable energy of a single man? Have we no such man among us? I am as sure as I am of my being that one vigorous mind without office, without situation, without public functions of any kind, at a time when the want of such a thing is felt as I am sure it is, I say one such man confiding in the aid of God and full of just reliance in his own fortitude, vigor, enterprise, and perseverance would first draw to him some few like himself and then that multitudes hardly thought to be in existence would appear and troop about him. You see, 99% of the people today who are trooping about the Carterites, etc., they're doing it unconsciously. And if such a seasonable man comes along as he says, could be you, they'll troop around you just as unconsciously. So it isn't a numbers problem. Now to get this off the ground, I'm going to ask you to let your imaginations run very, very wild. I'm going to ask you to imagine a man uh, who has had as many heartbeats as I have had, but his heartbeats have not been coming along 70 a minute like yours and mine but a thump about every year and a half. Well, you do a little fast arithmetic, and he was born about uh, three and a half or four billion years ago when this earth was nothing but a hot blob of gas. And this man, by reason of his lifespan, would have entirely a different frequency perception than we have. He would see only the forest and not the trees, whereas we see the trees and not the forest. 
I'll let Walt, my old friend, he's an old friend of mine, Walt Disney, explain to you what is meant by frequency perception. I think maybe all of you have seen this. But Walt did a rose planting. And uh, he put a motion picture camera on it and flicked a film about every day or two. And when the plant had grown and the rose had bloomed, he put that whole beautiful phenomenon on the screen. And you saw the whole thing in a matter of two or three minutes. What he did there was to alter the frequency perception. Well, this man would have entirely, as I say, a different frequency perception than we have. Just the forest and not the trees. And so, living all those years, he, uh, 35,000 years ago, he w would have observed uh, coming upon this earth uh, a character of man that the anthropologists referred to as Cro-Magnon Man. Cro-Magnon Man. And during these past 35,000 years, here's the way this man with his frequency perception would have seen uh, this. He would have seen man emerging in a straight line, just like that. <clears throat> of course, I am suggesting that man today is slightly ahead of Cro-Magnon man. Sometimes I doubt it. But nonetheless, that's the way he would have seen it. Just the forest and not the trees. But suppose you put a very, very powerful magnifying glass on that line. Uh, what would the interior look like? What would be its detail? I can tell you what it would look like. It would look like this. Evolution, devolution, evolution, devolution, with evolution inching ahead over the millennia. That's the way it would look. <clears throat> now we are in one of these periods here, one of these devolutionary periods. And uh, that's what we've been yakking about ever since I started uh, last Sunday evening, right? Uh, this mess we're in. Well, something pretty bad about that, but I wrote in one of my books one time, there's something good in everything bad if you can figure out what it is. Well, if I was right in that statement, there must be something good about this. I am now convinced that it is an absolute cosmic necessity. Suppose you were sitting atop the universe and had on your hands the job of bringing up a higher grade humanity. What would you do? Would you pep feed the population? Or would you give them obstacles to overcome? I think the latter. For it is an observed fact that the art of becoming is composed of the acts of overcoming. Hmm? This is absolutely true. As a matter of fact, it's this mess we are in which explains why you are here. Suppose everything were hunky-dory. Would you be here? You know this old Roman Horace 2,000 years ago said, times of adversity have the effect of eliciting talents which in prosperous times would have lain dormant. That's a very wise observation. As a matter of fact, as I say, this is why you are here. And to prove the point, all I want to have you observe, you don't have to take my view for it at all, but I want you to uh, take, a, uh, take a look at what's going on above your shoulders that would not be going along if everything were prosperous and hunky-dory, huh? In other words, it is expanding your awareness, your perception consciousness, without any question about it. Now, every one of these, every one of these devolutionary periods has created what I refer to as an anti-agent. And I'm suggesting that some of you who are here are potentially anti-agents. Uh, every, uh, every good movement in the history of the world has been led these are always very, very few. Every good movement in the history of the world has been led by an infinitesimal minority. I asked you the other night when I told you about uh, uh, Cobden and Bright and the work they did in Britain following the Napoleonic Wars. Two men did that job, did they not, huh? And uh, uh, go back 2,000 years uh, to the time of the perfect exemplar, huh? How many supporters did he have? Twelve. And one of those was a bum. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, as I say in England, and then you come down to well, come down to America and the founding, the Declaration, and the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. There were only a handful of persons who did all the thinking that went into that. The mass didn't know any more about it than they know about it today. Huh? That's what it is. It's always an infinitesimal minority. Well, uh, I want now to, having done this, I want to show you how at least I view this affair. I'm going to put on the board here 
a chart which resembles what the statisticians refer to as the normal curve. Hey. You wrote it. it was wet when you wrote it. No, no, it's wet now. <laughs> all right. Uh, here it is. It's the belly shaped curve. You're all familiar with it, huh? Looks like this. Now, this chart here is to symbolize American voters or adult Americans or whatnot. I'm going to divide it into segments. A little bit of a one here. A little bit of a one here. Now, this little one here is to symbolize the very few true believers in socialism. Call it what you will, it's all the same kettle of fish. Uh, very few of them. And over here is to symbolize the very, very few of those who believe in the free market, private ownership, limited government philosophy with its moral and its spiritual antecedents. Now in between these two little bits of groups exist the countless millions who so far as this subject is concerned couldn't care less. These people in here, they may be great computer designers or musical composers or whatever, but when it comes to this, uh, they don't do anything except to lean toward one of these camps or the other. And for the past few decades, they have been leaning here. And, uh, but don't overlook the importance of these persons in here. They're the ones that make the final decision. And if they keep on leaning this way, huh? And we're going to be like Russia or Red China or something of that sort. So I'm trying to suggest to you what an, uh, an enormous responsibility uh, devolves upon us who believe in this philosophy. In other words, uh, you've, you've, you've got to effect a, you've got to effect a turnabout causing them to lean this way. These people in here have no more aptitude for this philosophy than I have uh, to uh, write grand opera. And boy, that's pretty close to zero, huh? Well, uh, now, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that this is a leadership problem. Now, there is many levels of leadership as there are persons here. Well, there aren't very many. Uh, uh, that's more than I can talk about this morning. So I, what I want to talk about this morning are three ascending levels of leadership. And then you take the choice. Uh, as to the one to which you aspire. The first level of leadership requires nothing of the individual, no more, except that he or she not lend any support or give any encouragement to a single ideological or philosophical wrong, which I'm identifying as this over here. This individual in this level of leadership doesn't have to be a creative thinker, writer, talker of this philosophy. Just do no wrong. Well, you'd think that uh, uh, no ideological wrong. Well, you'd think that millions of people would uh, be able to get into this. But based on my 45 years of experience in this work, I'm, con I'm convinced that there's not more than one in 10,000 who could get into this even if they tried. Now, that sounds a bit startling. But let me explain why it's true. Number one, uh, in order not to do any ideological wrong, that is to uh, uh, not encourage or lend support to any single socialistic item, uh, you've got to know what socialism is. Go around and ask the people in your orbit, are you a socialist? You better put up your army, you're allowed to get socked in the snoot. Huh? Uh, 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 but then ask them to define what socialism is and see what kind of an answer you get. They don't know. And very few people do. It has a double-barreled definition. I don't care whether you call it communism, socialism, command society, whatever. And here it is. It's the state ownership and control of the means of production. That is your welfare. That, that's your planned economy. Hmm? And the state control, uh, uh, ownership and control of the results of production, which uh, is the welfare state. And that's what the definition is. Now, the person in order not to give any support or encouragement to any single socialistic item must not only be able to recite that, but must apprehend it thoroughly in his or her own mind. Huh? Uh, that's what the problem is. And uh, there's, there's, even more to, uh, there's even more to the problem than that. But uh, what, I, what, I want you to, what I want you particularly to bear in mind is that um, these people who 
lend no support or give no encouragement to any single wrong have an enormous radiating influence. Don't overlook their importance, even though there may not be more than one in 10,000. Now I come to the second level of leadership, and this is something quite different. This level of leadership requires the individual that he or she uh, know the subject. Uh, and uh, that this individual be a, actually be a creative writer, a thinker, writer, uh, speaker of this philosophy. This level of leadership requires of the individual that he or she give a fairly high priority among all activities to this subject. Um, well, uh, let me, uh, when I say know your subject, I mean f more than first meets the eye. Do you remember when you were a kid learning penmanship? You take out a piece of paper and a pen and you had to think your way around the letter A and the other letters of the alphabet. At that time, you never knew how to write. You never knew how to write until you relegated those physical movements to what we call the conditioned reflexes. And all you had to think about is what it was you wanted to write. You people who are writing right now aren't thinking about those physical movements at all. Or take driving an automobile. You don't know how to drive an automobile if you have to think when you do this or that to the wheel or this or that to the accelerator or brake. If that's the kind of a driver you are, don't take me to the airport. Uh, again, you, you, you don't know how to drive a car until you've relegated those physical movements to the conditioned reflexes. And the only things you have to think about is where it is you want to go and how not to get hit. Huh? That's when you know how to drive. Or take playing the game of golf. I hate to confess it, particularly when Rogi isn't here. But I don't know how to play golf. And you want to know why? Well, when I stand up at the tee, I have to think about... Uh, Getting, I have to think about my stance. I have to think about getting some of my weight on my heels. I have to think about uh, uh, flexing my knees. In my condition, I have to think about sucking in. I have to think about the straight left arm. I, I have to think about the grip. I have to think about the backswing. I have to think about the position of the club at the top of the backswing. I have to think about starting the club head slowly and speeding it up as it approaches the ball. I have to think about not swaying. I have to think about not looking up. I have to think about where it is I want the ball to go. And when I get through all this thinking I missed that damn ball. <laughs> uh, now you take, you, you take a good golfer and he's relegated all those physical movements to what the pros call conditional reflexes. And the only thing he has to think about is where it is he wants the ball to go, huh? I think about that too. That's all he has to think about. Well, uh, that's... Uh, now, why am I using these illustrations? Merely to point out when it is you know this subject. I tell you when it is you know this subject. When you can explain the fallacies of socialism and the principles of freedom with the ease and facility, as you can say, 42 to what, 6 times 7. That's when you know your subject. Well, there are not very many who know it. You know, this second level of leadership is uh, rather interesting. Over the years, I have received from countless people uh, letters to the, still get them, letters to this effect. Leonard, the socialists are winning. We are losing. Why don't you use their methods? Well, these poor souls don't understand that you use a different method to destroy a free society than you do to create a free society, huh? Uh, uh, entirely different methods. I'll, uh, I'll give you a little bit, uh, an illustration or two. Uh, I'll, I'll take a low-grade method, which destroying a free society is. Let's say that my objective is your demise. Will you ever stop and think of the low-grade methods I could use to achieve it? Plunk, 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 huh? Uh, uh, or let's say that my objective is making poets out of you. Well, this begins to get slightly absurd. Number one, I don't think about poetry myself. Number two, I don't know how many of you are potentially are poets. But is it not obvious that were my objective that uh, I would have to be a pretty good poet myself or you wouldn't listen to me. Is that not right? Well, that, that's, that's the way this sort of thing works. Now, uh, that is this second level of leadership. Now we come to the third level of leadership. And this is something quite different. I don't know anyone who's in it. But I, all I know about it, I, I know its definition and I know its imperatives. And those I know are applicable to us who may be fortunate enough to be in the first or the second level of leadership. 
And here is, here's what it is. That the individual achieve that degree of excellence which will cause other persons to seek his or her tutorship. And I want to suggest to you right now there's no limit as how far you can go in this tooting business. Uh, there was an old uh, philosopher, a wonderful man, St. Augustine, who wrote an autobiography entitled Confessions. I'm reliably informed that that's the most widely purchased autobiography in the world today. Why? Because of its excellence. People are were still seeking that man's tutorship who passed away nearly 16 centuries ago. Now, <clears throat> what is this imperative? It is to achieve that degree of excellence which will cause other persons to seek your tutorship. I'll go back uh, I'll go back to the golf course again. When I go out to St. Andrews to play golf, the, the members out there don't come up to me and say, Leonard, won't you please teach me how to swing a golf club? You know why? They are now aware of my incompetency as a golfer. But you wave a magic wand and put Jack Nicklaus there in my place. Every member of that club, huh? will tag him around, they'll try to learn from him. Is that not right? You take any field you want to examine, and this is true. Uh, well, um, so what I'm led to is this. Uh, you know, I, I've been in this business a long time, and I've seen a great number of persons who, by reason of one of these seminars, they've been turned on, and you know what they do the next morning, or as soon as they're going home, as soon as they go home, uh, they, 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 uh, go in and try to set their dumb neighbors straight. Well, I got news for those people. Uh, uh, their dumb neighbors uh, run around the corner when they see them coming. <laughs> and their dumb neighbors don't invite them to dinner anymore, and that's expensive. Uh, 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 so, uh, that, is not, uh, uh, that is not the right method. Uh, there are different ways of explaining this excellence uh, subject. Uh, you see, uh, when you, when, 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 when you reach this point of understanding, this point I'm talking about, you are as high up the scale as you can go. In other words, an understanding of this philosophy, human freedom, uh, correlates with wisdom and understanding. And by the same token, the meth methods must be commensurately as I. And I've said, as I said a while ago, what are the methods? It's being so good that people will seek your tutorship. Now I can tell you right now, I'll let you in on a secret, so you, you can know just how good you are. Observe how many people are seeking your tutorship. If there aren't any, you've got some homework to do. Huh? This is true. There are other ways of explaining it. Uh, this is one. Go only where you are called, but do everything within your power to qualify to be called. I don't mean just to make speeches or do seminars or whatnot. I mean, uh, you wait, from the, wait for the call from whomever, your husband or your wife or your neighbor or your employee or your employer. Who, you wait for the call. Now, uh, I have a I've had some interesting experiences in this respect. I ride uh, more oh, hundred thousand miles on airlines, and always up here, sitting to my left, literally and figuratively, uh, there's there's a character, and I know how to start a conversation uh, with this fellow, so that uh, uh, within about two minutes he will say, "Mr. Reed, what the hell do you do?" And uh, I've been called, don't you see? <laughs> now, if you want to ask me in the discussion period uh, what that method is, I'll be happy to tell you uh, what that method is. It doesn't always work. For instance, I was flying out to O'Hare one day to do a, uh, on the way to do a seminar in Aurora, Illinois. And uh, there was a character sitting at my left here, a fairly good looking fellow, up first class. And uh, so I began my routine, and sure enough, about 
30 minutes from touchdown, he says, Reed, what do you do? And so I told him, boy, did that go down with a dull thud. So I went back to my reading and writing. When I got off, he got off with five other fellows. And uh, my friend there was meeting me, who knew a lot of people around Chicago. He said, Leonard, do you know who your buddies are? I said, no, I was talking to one. Well, that little short fellow in the center is Jimmy Hoffa, and these others are his lieutenants and his guards. And I was... <laughs> How am I doing? <laughs> well, all right. Uh, <laughs> you see, I have a, I have a lot of fun. <laughs> well, anyway, um, now we get down to a bit of thing, how this thing works. <clears throat> you know, you, you're liable to say, well, now how am I going to develop this attraction? Uh, uh, who am I? Maybe I'm just getting started in this. And uh, well, that bothered me quite a bit, but I know a great number of people in this world, and among them are a good number of very high IQers. <coughs> and uh, among these IQers are some who understand this philosophy as well as anybody in the world. And with a, a few exceptions, there isn't anyone seeking their tutorship. You know why? They become, you know, suppose you're the best in the world. Huh? Uh, uh, what do you want to, what is there to do beyond that? Well, uh, uh, these people become so enamored with their superiority relative to our inferiority that they don't turn around in the other direction and see what they don't know. They don't know anything either, but they don't know they don't know anything, don't you see? But, uh, um, but I do know some people who are not such high IQers whose tutorship is being sought by others. And I'm going to give you the secret of it. It's in one word, growth. Growing in awareness, perception, consciousness. And this is easy to explain why it is. Uh, you're going to leave here now and you're going back home. Would you uh, like to go out tomorrow night uh, with uh, the person who has a, the broken record type of person? Yakety, 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 yak. Or would you rather go out with somebody who has the reputation of always having new ideas? Huh? I think the latter. For it is this growth in awareness, perception, consciousness that energizes the magnetism that causes this attraction, don't you see? It's that that attracts. That's what it is, and that's all it is. So the problem is growth. Now then, I want to demonstrate... Uh, uh, I want to demonstrate this a little bit. So I'm going to put on the board here... I'm going to tell you what it is ahead of time because like Ben Rogie, I got a failure in third grade art. But I'm going to put on the board here a, a sketch of Hoover Dam. Not because uh, it's a socialistic institution, but because all of you have heard of it. So uh, here I go. This is going to be Hoover Dam. You see it's all already beginning to take shape. Over here, over here is the dry side of the dam. And over here is Lake Mead. That's water. <coughs> now this thing is something of my own contrivance. This is a 12-inch pipe that I've protruded through the concrete, tapping uh, Lake Mead. But you notice there's a cap on here? No water will flow out of it. And by the same token, no water will flow into it. But watch what happens when I remove this cap. The water will flow out of it. That's a splash. And by the same token, an equal amount of water will flow into it, correct? What I want to call to your attention is that, is, that it is the, the giving off which is the precedent to the reception. You know what I did when I did this? I converted the potential energy of Lake Mead into moving, power-giving, kinetic energy. That's what I did. But the preceding to that was the giving. And this, this is the nature of hydraulic energy. It's also the nature of intellectual, moral, and spiritual energy. 
There's a little verse in the Bible that says it's more blessed to give than to receive. What is it? How do I translate that? It is the giving, the sharing, of which is the cause of the reception. Suppose you had a premise such as I gave you Wednesday morning. In other words, involvement, emergence, development, growth, uh, evolution, in awareness, perception, consciousness. Suppose you had that. Would you not then have to be the recipient of ideas? I think you would. Insights, intuitive flashes, etc. All right. And if you want to be the recipient, you, you share your ideas with others because the more you share, the more you receive. And the higher grade will be the ideas you receive. Uh, there are quite a few of my friends who are aware that the more you give, the more you receive. It's a very, very important point. Giving and receiving. Okay, maybe that's enough of that. I want now to show you how this sort of thing works. Uh, and to do so, in other words, over all these years, every time I see a person do a flip-flop from way over there to over on our side of the fence, uh, quick as a flash, I say, what caused it? Well, you know, over these years, I have seen, and I've been personally intimately acquainted with quite a number of people who are out-and-out -out communists who became some of the best persons on our side of the fence. Rose Weiler Lane was one. Huh? Orville Watts was uh, the leading socialist at the University of Manitoba. Turned out to be one of the finest thinkers on our side of the fence in America. I know a lot of them. So every time I see one of these flip-flops, uh, I say, well, what caused it? You see, I'm looking for the magic key. If I ever found that magic key, I alone could turn the world around. I'm just going to give you three examples of looking for the magic key. This took place back in 1946, the year we started fee. One Saturday night, I flew in from Des Moines to the Quad Cities in Moulin and uh, 10 o'clock at night and there was a young blonde fellow out there waiting for me and uh, he was the head of the Employers Association in the Quad Cities and we went to Rome and we talked till about 2 o'clock in the morning and he said, you know Leonard, when I was in college I was a socialist quick as a flash, I said, what flipped you? he said, it was that chapter in Hayek's Road to Serfdom why the worst get on top well, that book is only four dollars a volume, so uh, you buy a hundred copies of it, if you will, and give it to your friends in your orbit and call their attention to the chapter. I'll tell you what I'll do. If it flips on, I'll pay for the books. Isn't that a good deal? I'm trying to suggest that was not the magic key. Oh, here's another example. We had a young friend here at luncheon with me one day. Uh, his name was Ron Hemaway. Ron was a graduate student under Hayek at the University of Chicago at the time. He said, Leonard, when I was in the Bronx High School of Science, I was a socialist, quick as a flash. What caused that? Oh, it was, uh, he, he said it was George Reisman. Well, George Reisman, I said, I, I, know, I, I know George very well. As a matter of fact, when George was in high school, when he was a senior in high school, he understood and could explain as well as anyone I know, Mises' human action, as difficult as that is. I said, okay, Ron, what did George Sayer do? Well, we had him over at our house for dinner one night, and I was showing him our new refrigerator. And uh, so uh, George said to me, Ron, uh, how would refrigerators be distributed were it not for the market's pricing system? And he said it was that concept that flipped me. Huh? Well, well, try it out on your friends. You should know what that is. And if it flips one, I'll buy you three Martunias. Now I'm going to give you what I think is the best one. This was about a... Uh, uh, we were having a seminar uh, in a retreat place near Santa Cruz for Northern Californians quite a few years ago. And I had just finished a lecture before uh, luncheon on Saturday. And an old friend of mine, Verna Hall, who uh, had been in many seminars, uh, she wrote that Christian uh, uh, history of the Constitution and so forth. And she came down only for one purpose, and that was to introduce to me one of her, her this friend of hers, Rosalie Slater, who she explained 
uh, had been doing graduate work at Stanford University preparing herself to become uh, uh, an administrator in the government school system and lately Rosalie's had a change of heart and she wants to ask you some questions. Well, with the introduction, Vernon went back to San Francisco. So I said, come on, Miss Slater, let's have luncheon. So to get it off the ground, I said, tell me, Miss uh, Slater, uh, see, I'm, I'm trying to find out here. Uh, how did you, what, what, what caused this change in you? And then she made a statement that I have never heard, I never heard before, I've never heard since. She said, Mr. Reed, I have now been liberated for six months. Hmm? Beautiful. I'm not going to bore you with the conversation we had. But you ought to see the work that Rosalie Slater is doing. She and Verna were here a whole year ago, I guess. That gal has done one of the most fantastic books I have ever seen in my life. And uh, anyway, when I got back to San Francisco, Monday morning I phoned Verna and I said, what was it that turned her on? Oh, she said, we've been friends for a long time. This evening we were in my living room and not arguing, but just discoursing. I was making the point, listen to this that the extent to which an individual turns the responsibility for self over to another or lets the government take it away from you to the extent of that removal is a removal of the very essence of one's being. That's beautiful. Keep that in mind. Don't ever let anybody take it away from you or don't you ever give it to anybody. It's one of the most important virtues an individual can possibly attain responsibility for self. Well, what I'm trying to demonstrate to you is that there isn't any magic key. I'll write in your lab and say, well, Leonard, what do I do? Well, it is very simple. Uh, simple to state as it is difficult to achieve. But to see how much you can extend your own repertoire. See how good you can get at thinking, writing, and explaining this. And the extent to which you receive to that extent will the probability be increased that you will attract this or that person. Huh? That's what it is, and that is all it is. You all know about the law of probability. Uh, there's a greater probability that uh, one key out of a thousand will unlock that door than one key. Huh? And so what you do is to increase your repertoire. Now I'm going to give you an example of uh, how this sort of thing works. I could give you a thousand examples over these last uh, oh, 45 years of experience, but this is uh, a little more dramatic than the rest, and so I like to ham it up a bit like Rogi does. But this is an experience that took place about 20 years ago. I had written a piece entitled, There is a Shorty, No Moral Right to Strike. And I sent it, it was sent out to the 50,000 people on our mailing list. And in about three weeks, I received a three-page letter. The most vitriolic thing I have ever read in my life. He called me a dirty SOB, but he didn't know how to spell it. There's an A in it. Anyway, uh, 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 I'll say one thing about the letter. It had a hell of a lot of spirit in it. It was uh, on the letterhead of the Sailors Union of the Pacific, Portland, Oregon. That's Harry Bridges' outfit, of which there are Wait, no witcher, huh? And uh, this fellow's name is William Benz, organizer, meaning he was a strike organizer, don't you see? Well, instead of throwing it in the wastebasket, which you might be prone to do on such an occasion, I called in Reverend Edmund Opitson. I said, Eddie, I call him Eddie. I'm going to be away for three days, Eddie. And what I'd like to have you do is to write this character a letter giving him our treatment. Our treatment, I'll reveal to you what it is. It is to treat the person as high grade as you would treat the Lord. Well, Opitz is pretty good at that. Anyway, uh, when I came back, uh, uh, I read this masterpiece and uh, sent it to this character. And as fast as an airmail letter could go to Portland and back again, I received the most abject apology I have ever read in my life. This guy was absolutely crushed to think that he had written his kind of a letter to the kind of a person Obrich had made me out to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was getting kind of <laughs> fun, so I wrote him a thank you note, and I sent him a couple of little books, my Argentine lectures, Why Not Try Freedom, and Harper's Why Wages Rise, which was relevant to his yak. And After he read them, he wrote and said, 
Uh, this is the best stuff I've ever read in my life. Please send me more. Well, this is getting fun. So I sent him a half a dozen big books. Hope it says if you want to get something free, write, read a nasty letter. Well, <laughs> anyway, I sent him about half a dozen books. And after he read those, listen to what he wrote me. Mr. Reed, I hereby appoint you my director of reading. I hereby authorize you to purchase any book anytime, which in your judgment will help me with my thinking and send me the bill. Well, you guys wouldn't even do that. <laughs> this, is a, this is an amazing thing. Well, there began then one of the greatest correspondence I've ever had with anybody in my life. And uh, oh, six or eight months afterward, I had the occasion to go to Portland and I wrote him a note and I said, Mr. Benz, I'm arriving in Portland on Sunday night. I'll be at the Arlington Club. How about coming down uh, uh, Monday morning and having breakfast with me? And there he was at seven o'clock, a great big fellow obviously of enormous energy, uh, probably 47 or 8 years old. And we went up to the breakfast table. And at the beginning, he made several confessions to me. Number one, he never quite finished the second grade. And number two, until he came in contact with us, every moment of his life had been lived in hate. And then, to give you an idea of what kind of a life he lived, he caught me, I didn't mean to be caught, looking at his left hand, and the finger was off right under the palm. He said, oh, that. Got in fight on shipboard and son of a bitch bit it off. <laughs> well, that's the kind of a life that the guy had lived, you see. Well, anyway, I stayed with that. He was so interesting. I stayed with that fellow at the breakfast table until noon. I wouldn't stay with Carter that long. <laughs> anyway, uh, I had to make a speech at lunch. And uh, I invited him to come another place. And he came and brought a, another labor official. And when my speech was over, he said, uh, Mr. Reed, may I drive you to the airport? Well, I never destroy generous impulses, so I said yes. So on the way to the airport, I thought I'd have a little fun. By this time, I was calling him by his nickname. I said, Whitey, do you remember that first letter you wrote me? I bet it's the first time in his life he ever blushed. Yes, I remember. And then I said, Whitey, Suppose that I had replied in kind, would you and I be writing together? You know, he, my calling him an SOB with an A in it, don't you see? He said, angry, I'll say we wouldn't. So I said, Whitey, I'm going to show you what I did to you that you may do to others. And with this, I pulled my airplane ticket out of my pocket. I held it up against the windshield and I said, Whitey, what holds it there? He said, it's the tension of your finger. And I said, that's right. I want you to observe, Whitey, what happens when I remove the tension. I did that last year and it didn't come down. <laughs> I said, all I did was to remove the tension. I left you absolutely nothing to scratch against. And uh, and I cited him the old Arab proverb. He who strikes the second blow starts the fight. Whitey, you struck the first blow. I did not strike the second. You and I are buddies. He got the point. This correspondence went on at least for another year. Then all of a sudden, bang, not a word. I thought Whitey had defected. Anyway, uh, oh, it was three or four months later, I received a letter from him. Dear Mr. Reed, I bought a new automobile. I was on the highway, and I had a head on. And I've now been in this hospital for three months with these doctors trying to splice me back together again. But Leonard, you should see what I have done to these doctors on behalf of our philosophy. Isn't that some story? Now look, suppose that we hadn't had anything here. Hmm? No ideas, no literature, no nothing. Could that ever happen to that man? And maybe to those doctors? Huh? Well, if what we do here at Fee is right, to operate in our orbit, it's just as right for you in your in the operation in your orbit. Just see what a supply of knowledge, understanding, ideas, capacity to explain as you can acquire. That's what this is, and that is all it is. It's not a numbers problem. I'm going to try to make a little explanation of this. It's not a selling. I've, 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 I think I've made the point. It's not a numbers problem. I have a 
chapter in my book, this last book, Vision, entitled Why Not Separate School and the State. And this is a beautiful history done by William, uh, 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 done by uh, Andrew Dixon White, written in 1910. Few people in the world have ever read the book. I mean, in today's world. And it's a history of one man, a Venetian priest, one man who was solely responsible for separating uh, religion in, in the state. Huh? It's a fascinating one man. Or you read that last chapter in that book I gave you right now. Three men it was that turned around Germany after World War II, all of whom were personal friends of mine. Huh? Very, very. It's not a numbers problem. And I'm going to try to demonstrate to you now that this is not a selling problem. And uh, before you turn out the light, Bob, just let me make a little bit of explanation. Uh, there are certain words that are analogous or homologous, maybe, but uh, light and enlightened men, huh? and ignorance and darkness. Huh? And what I'm going to try to demonstrate to you this morning is that uh, 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 darkness has absolutely no resistance to light. And by the same token, ignorance doesn't have a resistance to enlightened men. Huh? So, uh, if you'll turn out the light there, <coughs> I'll, I'll try to give you this demonstration. I hope. Yep. Okay, turn around, Bob. I'm holding in my hand here a wee candle. I would like to call to your attention that every single eye in this room is on this wee candle. If there is an exception, please raise your right hand. <coughs> now I want to issue a challenge. I would like to see anyone increase the light in this room by distributing or marketing or selling this wee candle. I don't have to wait for an answer. It is obvious that it cannot be done. What then is the purpose of this wee candle? Well, maybe there's just enough light here, there is, for one standing right here to find and light his own candle, in which case the light in this room would be increased 100%, which is better than you can do in the stock market. Uh, 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 now then, uh, those two may make it possible for a few others right nearby to find and light their own candles, and it might go on till everybody in this room had... Uh, lit their candles, in which case there'd be a light enough in this room to read a book or maybe even to write one. Uh, as I told you, once upon a time I was a general manager of the Los Angeles Chamber, and in our city we had a place called the Los Angeles Coliseum. It held a hundred and holds 110,000 people. In one night, it was a bright night, it was a, a clear night, but no, uh, no moon, and the 110,000 people, the master's ceremony is about 10 p.m. Uh, at a given signal, the whole 110,000 people struck a little match. It was just like daylight, don't you see? That's how this worked. The darkness has no resistance to light. And I'm going to demonstrate this by uh, asking you to watch how the darkness sneaks out of this room as the light is increased. I can already see some of you in the front row. Hmm? I can see all of you in the back row. You see, that it has no resistance whatsoever. What is it that's kind of interesting about this? Well, uh, why is it attractive? Suppose, for example, that you had to stay in the room with the light there. What would happen to you? You'd go to sleep. Uh, if it were there and you had to stay here, you'd go to sleep. What is it then that makes this fascinating, attractive? It's this, a point I was trying to make in my lecture. It's this business of growth. Here's what it is, and this is all it is. See it? You know, I was doing this lecture one day in Aurora, uh, Ohio, and one of these points, a uh, uh, stupid thought flashed into my mind. Read, I wonder why it is that, um, this all took a second for the whole thing, I wonder why it is that uh, ignorance doesn't disperse uh, by reason of my enlightenment. Of course, the answer came in a flash of a second. Uh, I got news for you. 
here's Reed's light. But let me get it up to there, huh? And there might be one or two. Or there, well, maybe that's as high as I can go. But don't you, you get the point? In other words, the higher it is, the more attractive it is. The more, the more it grows, this is it. It's the growth. I don't care whether, it doesn't make any difference, folks. Uh, turn the light on, Bob. It doesn't make any difference whether you are growing from this level or this level or that level. It is growth that makes all the difference in the world. That's what it is and that's all it is. For a few examples of what I mean, uh, here's this guy, Anderson, and you had here, Aunt Senholz. Both of those fellows are aviators, huh? And so they're flying at night, and down here is a beacon light. You want to know something? That beacon light cannot see them, but they can see it. I may apprehend the wisdom of a Shakespeare. That wisdom does not know that Leonard Reed exists. Is that not right? Or if you want some proof of this further, go to nature and take a look at uh, those animals committed to the depths of the ocean or underground animals. They have no eyes to see. But over evolutionary time, as they move toward the surface, their eyes develop. Huh? Sure they do. There's an old English axiom. It's absolutely beautiful. It is light that brings forth the eye. So if you want to bring forth the perception of others, the formula is simple. Just see how much enlightenment you can acquire and share. The ideas of freedom as they relate to the meaning and the welfare of the individual have been clearly expressed throughout time, from the ancient Greeks to our founding fathers, and now many voices among us today. But not so long ago, in the years just after World War II, the voices expressing the freedom philosophy were few and isolated. It was a low point for the philosophy of limited government, free markets, and the private property order. The array of forces proposing various forms of socialism and the welfare state were being heard everywhere. The case for individual freedom was virtually unknown. One man in particular saw the need to gather the voices of freedom to provide a broad-based institutional framework. And so, in 1946, the late Leonard E. Reed and a few of his friends organized the Foundation for Economic Education to bring coherence, structure, and life to the ideas of liberty before it was too late. As Leonard Reed and his friends so clearly perceived, socialism was on the increase, not because it was right, but because no alternative was being heard. Voices for the free society had no platform from which to offer a positive alternative that was consistent, easily understood, morally correct, and intellectually exciting. The Foundation has been a significant force in changing that situation. Over the last 40 years, more than any other organization, the Foundation, or FEE as it is known to its friends, has acted as a first source, an introduction to the philosophy of freedom. While others have concentrated on policy studies, FEE has maintained a commitment to basic principles, the ideal concept always making the connection between economic education, moral and spiritual development, self-improvement, and the philosophy of freedom. There has been a profound and telling change in the public awareness of freedom, both in the United States and around the world. Now the ideas of individual freedom of choice, limited government, a free market economy, and private property rights are again claiming our attention. Much of this success can be attributed to FEE and to its effective efforts over the years in advancing the causes of liberty. Sound ideas are the most effective counter to the seemingly compassionate arguments of socialism. Part of FEE's mission is to discover and draw attention to the sound ideas and economic principles that underlie the free market. 
through a large and expanding publishing program. Since January of 1956, the magazine The Freeman has been published by the Foundation on a monthly basis. This study journal has gone to thousands of individuals for the asking. The Freeman, originating under the supervision of Paul Perot, is the oldest of the journals written from a free market perspective. As a matter of fact, when virtually no one else was interested in advancing free market ideas, the Freeman was quietly presenting its case to students, teachers, clergymen, and business people. And Fee presents that case through longer, more in-depth publications like The Law by Frederick Bastiat, The Mainspring of Human Progress by Henry Grady Weaver, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, Anything That's Peaceful by Leonard Reed, Human Action by Ludwig von Mises, and hundreds of others. Over the years, Fee has sold or given away millions of copies of various publications. Prices, free market, prices, direct production. You know, once in a while you may wonder that in this capitalistic system without a central plan, without a central brains in washing, telling 200 million Americans what to do, and yet there's a marvelous order of things in economic life, a very rational economic order, and, and without a central plan. And all this is achieved, accomplished, through the signal of price. Seminars. In the interest of more concentrated times of study, each year since 1952, hundreds of people have come to a wide-ranging program of fee seminars at Irvington, New York, as well as regionally throughout the country. In these focused times together, fee staff and guest faculty give participants an in-depth look at the freedom philosophy or present the freedom perspective on some topical subject. Soon or late, concludes Keynes, it is ideas which are dangerous for good or evil. End of quote. These people, as we know, worked hard and they believed that the products of their labor belonged to the individual producer, which is the basic idea of the free market economy. Right. Uh -oh. <laughs> this scenic estate on the Hudson River, just north of New York City, provides an ideal setting for person-to-person -person interaction, for those who are perhaps new to the freedom philosophy. Suppose one of you were offered a job that had wonderful working conditions. The young are often among those to whom the principles of freedom are new. For that reason, the fee staff have developed programs to take free market economic education into the colleges and high schools, with speakers willing to talk to entire student bodies, classes, or small discussion groups. And fee continues to reach young people through its undergraduate seminars, correspondence, debate materials, essay contests, and attractively priced books. What makes FEE different from other organizations dedicated to promoting the free society? Not just the length of time that it has been active, not just the quantity and quality of its publications, not just the seminars and classes that it presents, but its insistence on fundamental self-education and application. Rather than directly confront the people who imply that a free society can't work, the fee approach is to help individuals confront the ideas that are contrary to liberty by emphasizing the importance of basic philosophy and principled economic understanding. Only individual change can truly change society. Freedom is not licentiousness. Uh, freedom is acting in a moral or a responsible sense because to the degree that free will is exerted without a, res a sense of responsibility then instead of expanding freedom uh, freedom is destroyed the foundation for economic education through its many program activities is dedicated to individual freedom of choice, private property, and the free market economy 
which makes it possible. Thousands of people all over the country support our efforts. We sincerely hope that you will join forces with these many freedom devotees and let us send you a sampling of our materials. Simply write to us and we'll send you our monthly journal, The Freeman, along with descriptive material about our activities. Please write to Foundation for Economic Education, 30 South Broadway, Irvington, New York, 10533. Thank you.